Hello, my name is Ken Hayworth, and in this video I want to give a brief introduction to the concept of using aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation as a last resort medical intervention for terminal patients. ASC requires vascular perfusion of the deadly chemical fixative glutaraldehyde, so of course its application would immediately terminate the patient's biological functioning. But it does so in a way that simultaneously preserves the nanoscale structure of the brain. This allows the patient's brain to be stored without decay indefinitely. A terminal patient that chooses ASC is electing to pause their current life in the hope that decades or centuries from now, technology will have advanced sufficiently to revive them in a healthy form, most likely through some type of brain scanning and mind uploading. In this video, I will argue that ASC should be developed into a reliable medical procedure and offered as a choice to terminal patients. But I want to stress that ASC in its current state of development is not ready for application to humans. So far, it has only been demonstrated on animals under ideal laboratory conditions. This video is designed as a general introduction to the concept and is designed to spark debate in the medical and scientific communities regarding its potential. Clearly, ASC's goals are similar to the goals of traditional cryonics. As you probably know, cryonics is the practice of preserving the bodies of recently deceased persons using cold temperatures. Several cryonics organizations currently exist, and when one of their patients is declared legally dead, they immediately start cooling the body and perfusing it with cryoprotectant chemicals designed to prevent ice crystal formation. I personally was signed up with such a cryonics organization for several years, but I became progressively skeptical that their process might be destroying the delicate synaptic connectivity of the brain. The totality of the brain's synaptic connectivity is termed the connectome, and it is widely believed that this connectome encodes almost everything that we have learned since childhood that makes each of us unique individuals. If the connectome is destroyed, then there is no hope for revival of the person, no matter how advanced the technology. In contrast, if it could be shown that the connectome was being preserved in cryonics, then modern neuroscience theories would seem to support at least the possibility for future revival. This idea that our memories and individuality are encoded in the connectome is central to modern neuroscience, as the following quotes attest. Everything you know is encoded in the pattern of your synaptic weights. One of the chief ideas we will develop in this book is that the specificity of the synaptic connections established during development underlie perception, action, emotion, and learning. Memories are thought to be encoded as enduring physical changes in the brain, or engrams. Most neuroscientists agree that the formation of an engram involves the strengthening of synaptic connections between populations of neurons. The predicate of all modern neuroscience is that cognitively important functions can be explained as an emergent property of neurons and their network connections. I am my connectome. Several years ago, I asked cryonicists for evidence that their methods were preserving the brain's connectome. Specifically, I asked for electron microscopic evidence that would clearly prove that the brain's synaptic connectivity was being preserved, evidence of sufficient quality that it would also convince my neuroscience colleagues. Unfortunately, what I received was woefully insufficient to demonstrate this. My organization, the Brain Preservation Foundation, even put forward a challenge prize for anyone that could provably demonstrate a technique 
that could preserve the connectome of a whole mammalian brain for long-term storage. But after several years of waiting, no cryonicists were able to demonstrate to me and my neuroscience colleagues that their techniques preserved the brain's connectome. I am not sure that cryonics destroys the connectome. The evidence to date is simply inconclusive. But I am sure that they have not proven that the connectome is being preserved by their techniques. Such lack of evidence is clearly unacceptable for a procedure that is being offered to human patients. Because of this, I publicly withdrew my cryonics membership. But I did not give up on the central idea of cryonics. Surely there must be some way to provably preserve the brain's connectome. In fact, the neuroscience community developed just such a technique decades ago. That technique is to perfuse the brain's vascular system with the deadly chemical fixative glutaraldehyde. Each molecule of glutaraldehyde has two reactive groups that form bonds with particular amino acids and proteins. This creates crosslinks between neighboring proteins, gluing them together into a sturdy mesh. This process almost instantly stops metabolic activity in all brain cells, killing them instantly. But crucially, it kills them in a way that preserves their synaptic connectivity and that preserves their main nanoscopic and molecular details. Fixation of the brain via vascular perfusion of glutaraldehyde is an optimal way to preserve the information content of the brain. It has been the gold standard used for electron microscopic brain research for the past 50 years. And it has also been used for the highest resolution immunofluorescent imaging of biomolecules in the brain. But there are two obvious problems one faces when considering replacing cryonics with glutaraldehyde fixation. The first is that glutaraldehyde fixation alone is not adequate for extremely long-term storage of brains. A glutaraldehyde fixed brain will still undergo chemical reactions and diffusion which over many years can potentially erase significant molecular and structural information. Until very recently, this seemed a deal breaker, but research published in 2015 has now overcome this obstacle. The Cryobiology Research Laboratory, 21st Century Medicine, under the direction of lead author Robert McIntyre, developed a protocol whereby a glutaraldehyde fixed brain can be subsequently perfused with cryoprotectant chemicals in sufficient concentrations to allow for solid storage at minus 135 degrees Celsius. This technique has been termed aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation, and it has now been demonstrated to preserve the connectomes of rabbit and pig brains. In fact, it is this ASC technique that eventually was able to meet our prize requirements. This is a video of me holding the rabbit brain that eventually won our small mammal brain prize. As you can see, it was stored at minus 135 degrees Celsius as a solid vitrified block. After that brain was rewarmed, we prepared slices for electron microscopic evaluation and verified that neurons and synapses were beautifully preserved across the entire brain. And recall that ASC likely preserves the brain's molecular information just as well as glutaraldehyde fixation does. It should also be mentioned that there is no reason why ASC could not be applied to a patient's whole body. These studies just concentrated on the brain since it is the primary seat of memory and identity. Of course, the other obvious problem one faces when considering replacing cryonics with glutaraldehyde fixation is the fact that glutaraldehyde irreversibly glues all of a cell's metabolic machinery together. From a biological perspective, a glutaraldehyde fixed brain, or whole body for that matter, is about as dead as it can be, and it strains credibility to imagine how any future technology might undo such molecular level covalent cross-linking to restore biological functioning. 
So one can reasonably ask, what is the point in preserving the information content of someone's brain if it is impossible to revive them? To me, there is a clear answer. The person will be revived in the future through brain scanning and mind uploading. Revival from chronics is often portrayed in fiction as a process of simple rewarming. This is certainly not possible for a glutaraldehyde fixed patient, even if their whole body was preserved. But of course, this is not possible for traditional chronics either. Chronics organizations freely admit that there is so much damage being done during the cryopreservation process that massive repairs will be needed even at the cellular and molecular levels. It is of course difficult to speculate on what type of technology might be used in the future to revive someone since such technology is likely a hundred years off or more. But everyone I know that has thought deeply about this question has arrived at two possible scenarios. Revival by nanotechnological repair and revival by brain scanning and mind uploading. I, for one, am very skeptical that future scientists would ever bother to repair a chronically preserved person using nanotechnology. Not because I believe nanotechnology is impossible, but because I believe that future scientists would find it far, far easier to simply read off the information encoded in the brain's connectome and upload that information into a computer in order to revive the person via mind uploading. Our current understanding of the human brain makes clear that the mind is computational in nature and that our memory and personal identity is encoded in the connectome. Already today, we are seeing great progress in mapping small pieces of brains at the connectome level and in simulating small pieces of brains based on this connectome. Extrapolating into the future, it seems logical to assume that any future society that is advanced enough to repair a cryonically preserved person would also have the technology to upload that person. In fact, not only would it be far easier for them to simply upload the person, the resulting synthetic body and brain would also be far superior to the person's original biological ones in every way. If one agrees with this view, then replacing chronics with glutaraldehyde fixation makes perfect sense. Glutaraldehyde fixation does a provably better job than chronics at preserving precisely those structures that encode memory and personal identity. In fact, glutaraldehyde fixation is the first step in all of today's connectome mapping techniques, a fact that should make future brain scanning more straightforward. And an ASC preserved brain is stable for long periods of time, even at room temperature and can undergo multiple rounds of warming and cooling without significant degradation, making long-term storage vastly more reliable than traditional cryonics. For these reasons, aldehyde-stabilized cryopreservation should be considered the optimal preservation method for a terminal patient to choose today if they desire a chance at being revived in the future via mind uploading. To paraphrase the futurist Giulio Prisco, aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation is cryonics for uploaders. Now you might not believe that mind uploading will ever be possible, even after hundreds of years of continued scientific progress. Many people do not for various reasons, and skepticism is usually the best stance when confronted with such extraordinary ideas. But please realize that there are many scientifically knowledgeable individuals today that have thought deeply about this and have come to believe that mind uploading will be possible in the future. As a neuroscientist myself who works on developing new ways to map connectomes, I find it hard to imagine any scenario in which humanity continues to develop technologically but nonetheless fails to develop the technology needed to upload the minds of ASC-preserved patients. I recently published an article arguing this case in Skeptic Magazine, and I will be devoting some future videos to specifically making that argument.
Why am I and thousands of other people so enthusiastic about a future where mind uploading has been perfected? Well, a future in which humanity uploads itself into biorealistic synthetic bodies is a future where disabilities like paralysis and blindness are easily cured. It is a future where disease and aging will be remembered only as the historical relics of a brutal past, and where mental illnesses are as easy to cure as physical ones. It is a future where one can switch between different synthetic bodies as easy as we change clothes today, and one in which space travel can therefore occur at the speed of communications. It is a future where our minds will be free to explore ranges of experience that are simply impossible within the confines of the biological human brain, both superhuman intelligence and superhuman perceptions and emotions. This vision of the future is both frightening and exciting. But if humanity continues to progress technologically, then it is the future that our great-grandchildren will live in. Many who are more frightened than excited by this future may be thankful that they personally will not live long enough to experience it. But like thousands of other technologically progressive individuals, I would give almost anything to be able to experience that world firsthand. It depresses me greatly to think that my great-grandchildren will get to experience that future, but that I and my friends and loved ones will not. But when I look realistically at the pace of medical progress, the only way that the people of my generation will get to see that future is through brain preservation. In fact, brain preservation is likely the only chance most people watching this video have to personally experience that future. And this is the main point. The technology for brain preservation, aldehyde stabilized cryopreservation, exists today, at least as a laboratory demonstration, but it has not yet been developed into a reliable medical procedure that can be deployed in hospitals to save lives. If I, or one of my friends or loved ones, were facing a terminal illness today, we would simply be out of luck. Sadly, this is the situation for thousands of terminally ill patients right now who would choose preservation over the grave if they only had that choice. Brain preservation is literally our portal to the future. From a purely technical perspective, the integration of a reliable and regulated brain preservation procedure into mainstream medicine could be achieved in just a few years with only modest effort. But from a sociological perspective, there are many barriers to overcome. We formed the Brain Preservation Foundation to help overcome these barriers. It is our mission to get a reliable, scientifically proven form of brain preservation into hospitals as soon as possible so that all terminal patients will have the option to choose preservation over the grave. Further, it is the mission of the Brain Preservation Foundation to make sure that chemical brain preservation does not suffer the same fate that cryonics did, rejection by the mainstream scientific and medical communities. To ensure this, we are demanding that any preservation procedure must first be proven to preserve the connectome of laboratory animals in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. A strong, transparent regulatory process must be put in place to ensure that each individual patient receives the highest quality preservation. There must be case-by-case -case quality control, for example, via post-mortem x-ray CT and angiography, and via the electromicroscopic and molecular analysis of brain biopsy samples. Any financial incentives should be tied to the results of this quality control, again on an individual patient basis.
a strong, transparent regulatory process must be put in place to ensure that quality is maintained during long-term storage. And of course, there must be continued research toward improved preservation techniques and toward developing the technologies that will eventually allow revival. We believe that such evidence-based procedures, strong transparent regulatory controls, and case-by-case -case verification of quality are crucial to ensure widespread acceptance within the mainstream medical community. These are also essential to eventually getting brain preservation procedures to be covered by health insurance. So what is our plan to achieve these goals? The Brain Preservation Foundation has already stimulated research through our Brain Preservation Prize Challenges. We have also provided tens of thousands of dollars in research grants to laboratories developing brain preservation techniques. These efforts were in fact instrumental in the development of aldehyde-stabilized cryopreservation. Now we at the Brain Preservation Foundation are embarking on a new phase of our mission, one focusing less on developing the science of brain preservation and more on educating the world on its promise. We understand that the only way reliable brain preservation will become a choice for terminal patients in hospitals will be if thousands of people demand that choice for themselves and for their loved ones. So we will be making videos like these that explain the science of brain preservation in detail and that attempt to answer any objections, technical, scientific, philosophical, moral, etc., that are raised. And we will be working with colleagues in the scientific and medical communities to write papers addressing these issues at an even deeper level. And if you agree with this mission, we ask you to consider lending your voice to the effort. If you believe, as we do, that the conscious mind stems from neural computations in the physical brain, then say so. If you believe, as we do, that a person's individuality derives from learned experiences over the course of their life, then say so. If you believe, as we do, that a person's individuality is stored as structural and molecular changes in the brain, then say so. If you believe, as we do, that technological progress will continue and that it will eventually lead humanity to overcome biological limitations, then say so. If you believe, as we do, that all terminally ill patients should have the right to choose preservation over the grave, then say so. If you believe, as we do, that life is worth living and that a chance to continue life in the future is worth fighting for, then say so. And if you are as excited as we are at the prospect of personally experiencing the future a century from now, then say so. If enough people demand that reliable brain preservation becomes an option in hospitals, then it will. That is really all it takes, enough people to demand that option for themselves and for their loved ones. The science is there, and I believe the demand is there as well. Millions of us that accept the scientific worldview and that retain hope in the continued progress of humanity. If enough of us demand our chance to see the future, then we will all be able to get there together.